power spectral density describes the behavior of a single random process in the frequency domain and of course is the discrete time Fourier transform of the autocorrelation sequence. The cross spectrum and coherence are tools for describing the relationship between different signals in the frequency domain and they're based on the cross correlation between two signals. So we begin with the cross spectrum or the cross spectral density and this describes the correlation between two stationary signals in the frequency domain. So if we have the cross correlation being equal to the expected value of x of n y complex conjugate of n minus k and by the way in this lecture we're going to use the cross correlation assuming the signals in general are complex because it works out a little easier in terms of interpreting what's happening in the frequency domain. So when we've worked with real signals in the past we've only used expected value of x of n y of n minus k but if the signals are possibly complex we need a conjugate. So if we take the discrete time Fourier transform of the cross correlation sequence then we get the cross spectrum SXY of omega and we've just written out the discrete time Fourier transform here on the right hand side. Let's look at a little example to illustrate this and we'll assume that we have two signals that are associated with a single Fourier component. In other words they have frequency omega naught and we'll have a Fourier coefficient A in front of X of n and a Fourier coefficient b that's associated with the sinusoid in terms of y of n. And these Fourier coefficients are random variables. So we've got sinusoids with random amplitudes in phase a and b. If I take the cross correlation sequence between x of n and y of n, I find that that's just given by the cross correlation between a and b times the sinusoid e to the j omega naught k and taking the Fourier transform of this cross correlation sequence we obtain that the cross spectrum is the expected value of the product of the Fourier coefficients times an impulse and of course this is because we're only looking at a single frequency. So we see that the correlation between the Fourier coefficients a and b determines what the cross spectrum is. So if a and b are independent or uncorrelated in other words, variations in A don't correspond to variations in B. And when I say variations, referring to repeating many random experiments where we draw a value of A and then we draw a value of B, and we're averaging over many of those, which is represented by the expectation. So if these two are uncorrelated or independent, then this is going to be zero. If they're perfectly dependent, then this is going to be some non-zero value. But when we look at the cross spectrum, we're looking at the relationship between the Fourier coefficients associated with that frequency. The magnitude squared coherence is a frequency domain analog of the correlation coefficient that's used in statistics. And it's derived in terms of the cross spectrum and the power spectral density for the two signals. So we define the magnitude squared coherence CXY of omega as the magnitude squared of the cross spectrum normalized by the power spectra of x and of y. And just like the correlation coefficient, which is defined in terms of the correlation between the two random variables normalized by their standard deviations, the magnitude squared coherence is confined to be between 0 and 1. Now if we didn't have the magnitude squared part it could go from minus 1 to 1 but because it's usually used in terms of the magnitude squared uh, that restricts it to be between 0 and 1 and of course this is only defined when the power spectra of the process are non-zero at frequencies of interest. So if we go back to our Fourier component example we had that x of n was a e to the j omega naught n, y of n b e to the j omega naught n so we're basically looking at two sinusoids here, frequency omega naught, and they're random because the coefficients a and b are random variables. We showed on the previous slide that the cross spectrum is just the correlation between a and b, and this is only defined at frequency omega naught. Well, it's similarly, you can see that the power spectrum is just the variance of a, assuming a is zero mean, at frequency omega naught and the power spectrum of y involves the variance of b, again assuming b is zero mean. 
So if we substitute these values into our definition for the magnitude squared coherence, we see that at frequency omega naught, and that's the only one we're interested in, the magnitude squared coherence is basically the squared correlation coefficient that would be defined in statistics because it's just the magnitude squared of the correlation between A and B normalized by the variance of A and the variance of B. So clearly, if A and B are independent random variables or uncorrelated, then the numerator here is going to be zero and our magnitude squared coherence is going to be zero. On the other hand, if A and B are perfectly linked, that is, they're linearly dependent, for example, if B is equal to 2 times A, then the magnitude squared coherence is going to be exactly equal to unity. And in between, 0 and 1 will reflect different degrees of correlation or dependence between A and B. So the magnitude squared coherence is an important tool for assessing the relationship between signals, and it tells us what's happening in the frequency domain. We can think of it at each frequency as a correlation coefficient involving the Fourier coefficients associated with that frequency. Now the magnitude squared coherence is a very important property when linear time invariant systems are involved. We're assuming that we have some random signal x of n and that generates a new random signal y of n which is based on applying the filter or the linear time invariant system with frequency response h of e to the j omega to x of n. So y can be written in terms of the impulse response of this linear time invariant system involving the convolution with x using the fact that rx y of k is the expected value of x of n y complex conjugate of n minus k. We can substitute for y of n in terms of the impulse response and the convolution and then take the Fourier transform and we find that the cross spectrum between x and y in this case is the complex conjugate of the frequency response times the power spectrum of x. And similarly, the power spectrum of y is the magnitude squared of the frequency response of the linear time invariant system times the power spectrum of x. So we can substitute these definitions into the definition for the magnitude squared coherence. Working through the algebra, in the numerator we have the magnitude squared of h of e to the j omega times the square of the power spectrum of x. And in the denominator, we end up with the same thing. So provided that the power spectrum of y, which would be given, of course, by the magnitude squared of the frequency response times the power spectrum of x, provided that's non-zero, then we have a meaningful relationship here. We can just cancel out these terms and end up with exactly one. So if I take a random signal and I apply it to a linear time invariant system, the relationship between the original signal and the output of the linear time invariant system gives us unity coherence. Magnitude squared coherence is a way of testing the degree to which signals are related through linear time invariant system. Random signals that are related through linear systems have unity magnitude squared coherence. So this property allows us to test relationships between signals. Let's suppose I observe some signal x of n and I observe another signal y of n and I want to understand the degree to which x of n and y of n are related. In other words, how much of y of n can be described as a filtered version of x of n. Well, a scenario for analyzing this is to assume that our signals x of n and y of n are generated in the following way. And this is not necessarily how they would be generated in a particular experimental scenario, but it allows us to analyze different cases and the full range of relationships between x and y. So we're going to assume that the signal y is going to be a filtered version of the signal x plus an independent signal w. If I allow this filter to go to zero, then y is basically defined in terms of w. And in that case, x and y would be independent. If I let input w have very, very small power relative to the output of this filter, 
then X and Y are going to be completely dependent. So by varying the frequency response H of E to J omega and the power of this added independent signal W of N, we can consider the whole range of relationships between X and Y and look at how the magnitude squared coherence describes this relationship. So going through the various terms that we need to compute the magnitude squared coherence, we have the power spectrum of X, because that's just SX of omega by definition. We can find the power spectrum of Y. It's going to be given by the magnitude squared of the frequency response of this linear time invariant system times the power spectrum of the input. That'll be the power spectrum here at the output of the linear time invariant system. And since W is independent, we just add the power spectrum associated with W. So Sy of omega is the magnitude H of e to J omega squared, Sx of omega plus Sw of omega. And the cross spectrum between X and Y is going to be given by the conjugate of the frequency response of the system times the power spectrum of X. The W term drops out here because we're assuming that W and X are independent. Using these relationships in the definition of the magnitude squared coherence, we find that we have the magnitude of H V to J omega squared times S X squared of omega divided by S X of omega times S Y of omega, which is just magnitude squared H of V to J omega times S X plus S W. We can simplify the form of this expression to get a little bit better understanding, as I've done here, and I've written it in two different ways. In red, I've just divided through by S X of omega, and we see that in the numerator we have the magnitude squared h of e to the j omega times sx of omega. And that's actually the power spectrum of the output of this linear time invariant system. And in the denominator we have the power spectrum of y. Magnitude squared coherence between x and y is just given by the ratio of the power spectrum of the output of the linear time invariant system to the power spectrum of y. And we can also divide through the numerator and denominator by SW to write this in this form, where we see that the ratio between the power spectrum of the output of the filter and this added independent signal is a key factor that determines how the magnitude squared coherence varies. In particular, if the output of the linear time invariant filter is much, much larger than this added noise, then Y of N is mainly due to the output of this filter. And as we saw on the previous slide, the relationship between a linear time invariant filtered version of a signal and the original signal leads to magnitude squared coherence equal one. And that's of course because this ratio then is large and in the denominator it's large, so we can ignore the one factor and this simplifies and cancels out and this becomes exactly unity. Now on the other hand, if the signal W dominates in terms of the power spectrum, the output of the linear time invariant filter, as I've got in this second condition here, where SW is much, much greater than the power spectrum of the filter output, in that case, we're basically looking at X and Y being independent signals because the contribution due to the filtered version of X is very small and we would expect the magnitude squared coherence to be zero and that bears out from the expression here too because in this case this number is very small and this ratio here is very small so in the denominator we basically have one and in the numerator we have a very small number and so that's going to go to zero and then finally if the output of the filter and this added independent signal have roughly equal powers at a particular frequency, as I've shown here, where SW is approximately equal to the power spectrum of the filter output, then we get half of this signal Y is directly related to X, and the magnitude squared coherence turns out to be 0.5. And you can see that because this ratio is going to be approximately 1 in this case. So we have 1 over 1 plus 1, which is 1 half. Now clearly, as the power spectrum of the filter output 
increases relative to the power spectrum of this independent signal, then we're going to get a stronger relationship between X and Y and vice versa as the output power spectrum here decreases relative to the power spectrum of this added independent signal, then Y is going to look more independent. So our original goal was to test the relationship between X and Y. And what we see from this analyzing this example is that if X and Y have a large value of the magnitude squared coherence, then that tells us that Y is generated mostly as a linear time invariant filtered version of X. On the other hand, if the magnitude squared coherence between X and Y is small, close to zero, that tells us that Y is mostly independent from X and the value of the magnitude squared coherence between zero and one tells us in a sense how much of Y is directly related to X. So the magnitude squared coherence is used in practice as a tool for evaluating the relationship between signals.